So uh, using and extending edX e-commerce, uh, welcome. Uh, I am Zachary Rockwell, um, and this isn't working all of a sudden. So I will hit next. And I'm the manager of the e-com team at edX in Cambridge. Um, I have been at edX for about a year and a half. Uh, before we came, before I came here, there was uh, what we called shopping cart, and we have implemented a couple of e-commerce along with some other systems in there. Uh, my main background is I come from uh, an e-commerce background. I was at Rue La La for about three years. We actually did a pretty major replatforming of uh, from PHP to a Python Django based shopping cart app. So I really was very excited to bring that opportunity to something like edX in a nonprofit and education space. So and I'll let Bill introduce himself real quickly. Hi, uh, my name is Bill DeRussia. I am a software engineer on the e-commerce team. Uh, and yeah, I've been working at edX for almost a year now um, and working on everything, including the e-commerce platform, uh, as well as some of our other initiatives uh, around APIs and uh, of course catalog and kind of a lot of the exposure and how do we get users and learners to see all the courses that we have to offer um, beyond just enrolling. All right. And I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so I, I just want to start with a quick start for what edX e-commerce means to us. Uh, the most important thing I want to say is that edX and open edX are the same thing in our mind. We are we are doing everything in the journey to get it out to open edX. Uh, we, we have that in mind with everything that we do work on. So why, why did we build edX uh, e-commerce? It's a very good question, but I actually want to get an idea of the people in the room. Do, does anybody in here actually use auto and our new e-commerce platform versus a shopping cart? And so <laughs> do people use shopping cart? Okay. So. We, as far as the why, is we were really trying to figure out the best way to evolve shopping cart. And we were really looking for that ability to extend traditional e-commerce functionality. And shopping cart, as, as great as it was for there, is integrated in the system. And there's a lot of things that we wanted to do as edX, experimental, uh, experimental e-commerce things, uh, bundling, purchase, A-B test. And shopping cart was as fantastic as it is, just wasn't able to give us that there. But the main goal in why do we have e-commerce and edX at the same thing is financial sustainability, which is one of the main goals of edX is to be able to support the courses that we have there in a sustainable way. Um, we really, as I said, we're trying to get to an extensible system. Uh, we are also trying to move to a micro architecture, microservices architecture, and that's actually one of this was our first IDA, was our ability to deploy auto and our e-commerce stack completely separately from platform. Uh, this allows for the dev team to be able to deploy when ready, as opposed to what we usually have to wait for is the train, the release train to go out there. So we're able to make quick adjustments a lot faster than we were able to do in the past. Uh, the other part of it is that we, we handle a large amount of money and we're really looking for a reliable platform to be able to do that. Uh, our, our journey has taken us to the point where uh, I think we're, we were able to do uh, cl close to a million dollars of transactions in the first couple of months, but it's, it's something that you need to have that reliability and structure around. Um, and I keep on hitting the wrong one. So what is edX e-commerce? Uh, I've kind of hinted at this, but um, edX e-commerce consists of three really different aspects of it. It's based off of Django Oscar. Uh, one of the things that we were looking for here was an open source application that fit all of our product needs and also was in, in our development wheelhouse. Uh, what we didn't want to do is have a new PHP application come in or some other option. We really wanted to be able to extend this the way that we extend edX platform. Uh, edX extensions are what we are building on top of Oscar. This includes a lot of our payment integration, payment integration and uh, things such as our fulfillment engine. Uh, things that we need to do special in order to get e-commerce on an educational platform done. And then the third part of it is that there's edX applications that we are building on top of that. This is a course administrative tool. 
edX as a business needs to be able to limit access to certain aspects of the tool and actually have a workflow where the business can scale. And so we've been able to build custom tools on top of this. If you, if you look at some of the edX extensions that we have done, one of the important ones is an API that actually allows us to have our own tool talk to our Django Oscar instance and be able to uh, create courses, create seats, and Bill will go through a little bit of a demonstration a little bit later on that. So what is this? <laughs> uh, Oscar plus edX in our mind equals auto. Uh, auto is, uh, we spent weeks researching this name, is Oscar the Grouch's baby brother or cousin, <laughs> and it just made sense. But if you, if you need, when, I, when I say auto, I really am talking about the edX e-commerce platform. It's, it's the heart and soul of everything that we do as far as purchase, uh, the intent to purchase, all the way through fulfillment. Uh, also, I like the little auto guy. Um, so who uses edX e-commerce? So really, we build the system for two different types of learners, uh, two different types of uh, people. Uh, one is administrators, and the other one is learners. Uh, a lot of these go hand in hand, and you know, you chicken egg situation, you have to be able to create a seat before you can have it purchased. But a lot of the things that this handles are payment process, coupon code redemption, receipts, refund, order history from a learner perspective. And from an administrative perspective, it's that ability to create that seat, the ability to have your e-commerce system actually control some of the dates. Uh, and th this is actually part of that integration where our, our seat creation actually will update LMS so that we have the correct dates and refunds, reporting, and coupon code creation. So we will walk through a lot of these things a little bit later on. So what are some of the major, major concepts of auto and how we approach this? So before I, I came to uh, edX, we didn't really have the concept of a SKU or a seat or a product type. Uh, what we were doing is we were basically using enrollment through shopping cart to, per to go through everything. There are a couple of goals of what we wanted to do with auto. The first one was we wanted to capture everything as an order. It didn't matter if it was a $0 order, of, so an enrollment into an audit course or an honor course. We wanted to have a centralized location where we could actually look at a student's or a learner's complete order history. Uh, but this really does start with the concept of a seat. A seat is one of the product types that we have in the system. And really what a seat is is the way that we represent the intention to enroll. Um, this goes through the auto basket, which if you go to edX.org is a, uh, a ghost basket. It actually will process it as far as that. Uh, you don't really see it. You just go straight to the payment processor. But this actually is a key step is because now what we can do is we can actually extend the system to allow multiple courses to be added, multiple browsing and a traditional, more of a traditional e-commerce experience of being, hey, I'm going to browse, buy, add to cart. Uh, as far as that goes. The baskets are what we use to track that, and then those get converted to orders. Uh, there's payment processing and everything else that goes along with an e-commerce experience, but essentially the key concept is a seat is essentially the SKU, and, in the and the end result is a fulfillment. And in our case, our fulfillments are enrollments and courses. That doesn't always have to be the case. We've built this extensively. You could have it be other things. It's not just an enrollment engine, it's a fulfillment engine. Uh, there's parts of a seat and there's uh, seat attributes which we are beginning to explore and this is the ability to let's say add a textbook or a cohort or a something what you want to do special or different than there that will you'll be able to fulfill differently on so that's really representing that object throughout the process so using edX e-commerce and I'll get hand it over to Bill all right, caution, live demo approaching. Um, let's see if we can get this to go without completely, yeah, ooh, awesome. So, Great, right. so uh, for those of you who are uninitiated, this is Studio, uh, and for this I'm gonna kind of walk through the administrator experience through auto and kind of what the learner will see <laughs> once an admin has created the framework for enrolling in a course. So it, for a little hand waving, uh, we have already created our course in Studio. So we're just going to grab the course ID 
And right, so this is uh, the course admin tool, uh, sometimes referred to as CAT. Um, and this is where you're going to create your course seats. Uh, this used to be done through the Django admin. Uh, one of the reasons why we created the course admin tool is to offer uh, more features around validation. Uh, we were, you could basically put whatever you wanted into the Django admin. Um, this gives us a little more control over making sure that you're putting you know, the right things that follow some more of the business rules. Uh, so we're gonna create this course in here. We're just gonna grab the ID. We're gonna give it a name which we'll call the Open edX Demo Course. And we're gonna pick a course type. So this is the seat generation step. So we could pick a free course, we could pick a verified course, and those seats all show up down here. So as we select different options, different seats are being uh, populated for us. So our audit seat uh, goes along with our verified seat and then we're gonna change the price here to $10 so that it's really easy to get to. Um, and then you can set deadlines. Uh, all the deadlines will default in LMS to, I believe, 10 days before the course ends. Um, but you can also customize that in here. And as we're moving away from honor seats, uh, that's taken out of the traditional workflow, but we still let you include honor seats. We're gonna skip that for now. And now we've created our course, uh, our course seats rather. These are now products in e-commerce that students can use to identify uh, enrollment uh, if they are interested in enrollment. And the next piece, uh, we also have a coupon admin that we recently rolled out where you can create a coupon. And we will create one right now. We're gonna create a discount code for our verified course. And let's have it run from yesterday until the end of the month. And this coupon has a couple of options. Uh, we're gonna choose use once by one customer, but you could obviously choose any of these multiple by multiple customers, um, once by multiple customers. So we're gonna create a custom code here called open edX 2016 and give it a value of uh, half off. Great. So, so yes? If, if I want to reuse the honor certificate like in the face in the past, I can make couple so that people will have free, um, uh, free certificate. Yes, yes, so you could, go, you could and should uh, go into the course admin tool and select the honor seat, and that will create an honor SKU seat in e-commerce that would be linked to the honor seat uh, that you have in the LMS so that when a learner enrolls. I didn't see the honor seat type of the, you know, the uh, Yeah, it, it is uh, at the bottom of, uh, well, it's. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we, we, we have, this is the tool that we actually use actively here, and we're no longer creating courses with honor seats in them. So we actually do have that option to be able to add a honor seat, as he was saying. Um, the tool could be easily modified. It's actually just UI uh, skinning on it that we're not taking away the ability to create an honor mode just for our uses, is that there is no reason to have the honor mode flow uh, be part of our flow. But this tool could be extended upon to be able to add that instead of, let's say, audit. Um, that's actually what the swap was, is audit versus honor. Uh, it used to be the honor mode. But the fulfillment engine will take that seat and then put you in the right mode in LMS. Okay. Right. So at this point, uh, our admins have configured their coupons and uh, course seats for uh, learners to be able to go enroll. So as a learner, I've already enrolled myself in this course. And when I go to upgrade, uh, so this is a checkout page hosted uh, through the e-commerce platform. And at this point, we've created uh, a basket. So if you remember back to the previous slide, this is now an intent to buy this uh, verified course seat that lives in the e-commerce system. And if we want, we could also apply a coupon code. 
and now we get our 50% off, and we can check out. Let's. I really hope this part works. I don't have control over this part of the demo. And all right, so we're going to hand wave over that. PayPal integration is integrated, uh, and when you PayPal, when you complete this transaction, you land on a receipt page, um, which then means your basket has been converted into an order, which is tracked um, for order history, and it's on the dashboard page on e-commerce, where you can see. I can go there. Where you can see all of your recent orders, um, how much uh, how much you've been processing that day. You can run reports from here, uh, and all this is kind of baked into uh, Oscar. Uh, so we're mostly leveraging all of the great open source work that's gone into that project, um, and it's more of the the custom edX stuff is the the coupons and the course admin interface to kind of utilize a lot of our business logic. Um, to make sure that those are going. All right, so we can close that. Uh, yeah. Is ER supporting multi-processor at the same time? Multi-payment processor? Yes, so we support, um, on our site, two payment processors, PayPal and CyberSource. Uh, Oscar allows you to integrate other payment processors. I know there are a lot of, a lot of people who've uh, done their own payment processor integration. Um, that's something we'll talk about later, how to, uh, what's kind of coming up on our roadmap to make that easier. Right now, that's not the easiest process, and that's probably one of the top questions we get asked is like, how do I integrate Stripe? How do I integrate Braintree? Um, and there are a lot, you know, depending on what country you're in, there may be a whole host of other options. So we're trying to make that easier. Um, and so the next piece that I wanted to talk about is kind of diving into a little bit more of the code. Uh, how many people here are, uh, would consider themselves non-technical? A couple? OK. Uh, I'll try to keep it approachable for everybody, um, but there is going to be some code on the screen, so don't be afraid. Uh, I could ask a question. Please. Yeah, so that uh, payment of taxes, yeah, payment of taxes is uh, handled in the Oscar system. If you actually, if you look at the code, it is a blank method uh, because they do not assume what kind of tax structure. So uh, you can go and modify uh, the tax implementation, like how if you want to do VAT or if you want to, if you have some other local uh, tax structure that you need to. That's already baked into Oscar, and you can go and extend Oscar to use your tax rules, uh, and they'll get applied automatically through the checkout process. And my understanding is in Europe, it's different depending on the physical location of the body. Like if the student is physically located in Germany, they have a different tax obligation than if they're physically located in France. Yeah. So, uh, so the the system. The system handles tax in the sense that it knows how to apply tax and when. It knows when to apply tax. It does not know how to apply the taxes. So that would be a custom extension that you would need to write depending on the laws that you need to follow. Uh, edX, uh, as a nonprofit, we actually don't implement any of the taxes because we are exempt from that. So that is not something that we've had to deal with. Um, but that would be how you would deal with it. And I want to customize the receipt because I need to display some kind of legal in, in, uh, information on the, the receipt. It means that uh, I need to go in, in the code, inside the code. Mm -hmm. uh, so the receipt page right now isn't configured to handle tax information, but it could be something that could be as simple as just saying if a VAT was applied show this field. Uh, but you, the, the system is set up to handle that. Uh, it just, we haven't had a reason to implement it yet. Right. Um, we, on our roadmap, we do have a couple things coming up, such as geopricing, which is very similar to the VAT problem, is not just figuring out where people are from, but what currency to offer it in. 
uh, the, these are problems that we are going to be taking on, and it's actually uh, one of the reasons why we chose Oscar is that they have a lot of this built into it that you know, 90% of the work is already done for us. There is 10% of the work that we have to do. It's a very similar problem with the VAT. It's, it's the tax part is built in. You just have to do the 10% of the work to implement the rules. Right. Um, Which is a great lead-in uh, <laughs> into how would you extend e-commerce for your own use cases. So thank you for the. Uh, what about subscriptions? Can you do subscriptions with both? Uh, like, like recurring? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if. So, Oscar supports that natively. So Oscar, so you're really looking more for a payment processor that supports that. So PayPal, I know, has a. No, sub I'm only subscription, via subscription, yeah. all kind of scenarios. Yeah. So uh, Oscar, I don't believe has that inherently in there. I, in the past, I've used the third-party payment providers to do that. I know PayPal offers a subscription model where you can say every six months give them a charge, every month give them a charge. Uh, the way that the PayPal integration works would allow you to be able to say, hey, when PayPal gives me this feedback that they've paid, yeah. go ahead and implement this part of the fulfillment. Um, we haven't tested that out, but that is definitely a capability you could do. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure you all have a lot of very interesting use cases that we haven't considered, and that's kind of why we wanted to include this piece in the presentation. Um, so I'm going to walk through a use case that we had to add to the e-commerce platform recently, but the the main takeaway, uh, which we can get to, is you know, how should you be thinking about your customizations and how, you know, where do you start when you say, oh, I need to add uh, you know, recurring payments, like, and I have this whole platform in front of me, where do I even begin? And hopefully this gives you kind of that foothold um, to get started. So uh, what we had to add recently was the uh, ability to associate orders with an affiliate cookie. So if you had an affiliate partner, uh, a user lands on the edX page from an affiliate partner, and they drop a cookie to uh, just say that you got that refer, you were referred by uh, that partner. You know, when you check out, and if you, st if you still have that cookie, we want to be able to link those things together to give credit to that affiliate partner, whether that's just data internally to know which partners are you know, most valuable and driving the most valuable traffic for us, uh, or potentially a monetary relationship where they get a percentage of that payment. Uh, there are lots of models that you can extrapolate from, but this is kind of the, the basic use case that would be required. Um, and again, uh, the whole point of this is not necessarily that this example is uh, you know, the way to extend Oscar, but it's indicative of the way you would think about your own use cases uh, as you go forward. Um, and the second point, uh, right now, uh, like you mentioned, you have to go into the code and really like edit the source code, and that is uh, not the most ideal way to extend the platform, so we are uh, actively pursuing feature upgrades that involve pluggability, so you can just write your one file and put it into the, the setup.py so it just gets preloaded and you don't have to go in and be touching the source code and editing the various you know, native methods. Um, so that should make things a lot more approachable and that is something that's on our roadmap. Uh, but for right now, if you wanted to start tomorrow, this is the way to do it. So first of all, you wanna break down your problem, uh, your use case into kind of the, the two or three uh, main focuses that Zach talked about. Is this functionality covered by Oscar? Uh, is it kind of covered by Oscar, but I need it to do a little more? Or is this something that Oscar is, it's not Oscar's job, uh, and we need to build it from scratch? So in our case, uh, those two pieces would be, Oscar does not have a referral concept, so we need to kind of build that referral concept but we want to link referrals to baskets and orders. So we're going to have to extend uh, Oscar's basket and order functionality to have it become aware of our new model. Um, so the first part's really easy. We just add a new Django application. Um, this is standard Django. And we add it to our installed apps. So there, it's in our installed apps. We now have a link to our referrals Django app that we created. Uh, you can see at the bottom, it's just installed apps, just like anything else. Uh, we've broken ours up into 
Django apps and local apps and Oscar override apps, um, but it's just installed apps. Uh, then we create a referral model. Um, for our use case, it's pretty simple. So we just have an affiliate ID that we're going to link to baskets and orders. Uh, we could have chosen to extend the basket and order models and include that on there, but in, for performance reasons, we wanted it to be its own contained piece so that we're not touching something that has a table with millions and millions of rows uh, and needing to do downtime. This was uh, as easy and a little more maintainable for us. Uh, so the next thing we need to do is the baskets. So we have our referral model, now what do we do with it? Um, so we need to get the baskets talking to our referral model. So this is the Oscar apps that I referred to earlier and we are already overriding uh, Oscar's basket functionality. So you can see there, uh, if we weren't, we would simply add, we're, we're overriding quite a bit of Oscar functionality at this point, so chances are it will already be there, but uh, Oscar has things like wish lists that we haven't touched yet. If you wanted to extend wish list functionality, you would simply add the Oscar wish list uh, into the overrides. Uh, and as I referred to earlier, when we were on that basket page, the right before we checked out, uh, that is a custom view that we created because uh, in a typical e-commerce scenario, you would have a basket that you can have multiple items. You can have you know, your, your socks and your t-shirts and your pants all in your e-commerce basket and buy them all at once. In our case, we actually wanted to direct users to buy a single course at a time. Uh, so we created our own view into that. Uh, so this is just that custom overridden view. And at the end of that, we call a method called prepare basket, which gets our basket ready for checkout. Um, so diving into here, you can see at the top, we're uh, in the file structure. Uh, we're in e-commerce slash extensions slash baskets. That is uh, our own uh, naming convention for where we're putting things we're gonna override Oscar. Uh, and the prepare basket method grabs the basket from the user and then we're gonna do stuff with it in the middle and then we're gonna return that basket out. Uh, currently there's this code in here, don't look at it, it doesn't matter, it's not important for the demo. Uh, this is us preparing coupons and after that we are going to do add in our functionality which is taking that cookie, grabbing the affiliate ID from it and if there was one, uh, updating our referral model, otherwise getting rid of that referral model because perhaps that cookie is expired and we no longer want to associate uh, that affiliate with that basket anymore. Uh, and that's it. That's now, whenever we go to that basket page, we'll be associating any affiliate cookies with our basket and that meets that part of our use case. So the next piece is adding, uh, adding it to orders, which is a little bit of a deeper dive into Oscar. So in the Oscar documentation, this is uh, the Oscar GitHub page. Uh, Oscar has a method called create order model and we're just going to simply override it, like basic, basic development. Um, first we're gonna double check that we're already overriding uh, orders. Uh, that's looking at offers, but orders right below it. Uh, so we're good and then we import the original order creator from the Oscar um, package and we, over, we inherit it for our own order creator. We override that method. We copy in the original functionality so that we're not losing anything and then we add in our referral logic to, from the basket that we already have that's going to get converted into an order we're gonna find our referral, associate it with that order and save it and then there's some, uh, some try accept blocks just to make sure that it doesn't ruin. Uh, if something goes wrong, it doesn't interrupt anything in the actual order process. We can just log it and track it so that our affiliate work doesn't prevent someone from actually creating an order. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it at a high level. I went through that kind of fast, uh, mostly because that use case is, uh, that's already in there and hopefully you're thinking about how it maps onto your own standard use cases. Um, 
But uh, one thing I add is the, the lever uh, leveraging Oscar's documentation. They have really good documentation. Um, their source code is very readable if you want to actually dive in and really see what's going on uh, in the guts of it. Um, so hopefully that helps. And again, you know, some of the we were overriding full methods and copying and pasting, you know, the original Oscar code into a method that we're overriding, and that obviously isn't the ideal approach. Uh, we'd love to have more of a pluggable approach for uh, extending Oscar, and um, one of the things we need is kind of that we need some community feedback as to what are your use cases? Um, what things should we prioritize making pluggable? Uh, payment processors is uh, on a roadmap and going to be happening soon. Um, so that one we've heard loud and clear. But beyond that, uh, the, the use cases are kind of far and few in between. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, your feedback as to what things you would find helpful so that we can put that onto our roadmap to help you guys you know, develop faster. With that, I'll give it back to Zach. All right. All right, so um, as, as we've been alluding to this a little bit, uh, but we do have a roadmap for where we want to take e-commerce uh, at edX. Uh, a lot of these things are near term, some of these things are midterm, some of these things are pretty far out. Um, and as Bill said, we are looking for feedback on this, but uh, Adyen integration, so uh, CyberSource is what we mainly use now. We're looking to use Adyen pretty quickly. Um, we've, we've done a couple of examples with Stripe, but I know the community has done some other uh, uh, implementations of this, but we really are looking to do that. Um, we are then looking to do plug and, plug and play. Uh, we are trying to move as quickly as possible, so sometimes it's not always, the roadmap doesn't always align perfectly. Um, but another thing that we are looking to do, and uh, I don't know if we've talked about this, but the ability to do product bundles. So that ability to purchase not just one course or one seat, but that ability to say, I want this seat in this course at this time, I want this seat in this course at this time, I want this seat in this course at this time, and say, I'm gonna purchase all three of these at the same time. Um, there are a lot of implications to that, is that let's say you wanna say you buy three courses, you get a 30% discount. We are gonna be looking how to, how to implement that and being able to have deep discounting and also be able to purchase things as an individual product. Traditional kind of e-commerce you know, bundling as far as that goes. Um, I alluded to this earlier, geopricing is something that we are going to be looking to be doing is that we would love to be able to offer our courses in different currencies. Uh, we know that one of the reasons why we chose Oscar was that it had this capability built into it. We're really looking to start exploring that. Um, we are looking to keep uh, upgrading and along the path of Python. Uh, that that's always just seems to be something that we want to call out because we have to retest all this. I mean, this is important. And this is one of those areas that we want to make sure we test uh, you know, all the time. Um, we're looking for Docker support, uh, DevStack support, ability to bring this up quickly locally for developers. Uh, I know that there's some configuration that still needs to happen now. Um, we are also looking to remove shopping cart from the code base. Uh, one of the goals of Auto is to get to parity with the shopping cart functionality that we have there and then use this opportunity to clean up the code base. I know there's been a couple of presentations of how big edX platform is. This is hopefully reducing the size of that uh, and the complexity. Um, and we're always looking to do uh, automation and document improvements. Uh, looking for the community for help for that. We're looking at edX to keep on producing high quality documentation too. Um, so how can you help? Um, there's a couple of ways. Uh, we have the e-commerce code base available on GitHub. Uh, feel free to make a pull request there. Look at what we have now, uh, add there. We have the ability to add documentation too to the documentation repo. Um, we will be participating in the hackathon tomorrow. Uh, Bill will be here. I know the Cambridge team will be participating from Cambridge. Uh, we are really looking to see what your guys' ideas are for a hackathon and really help you guys out with, for, as far as that goes. Um, and then Slack. Um, I think the e-commerce room on Slack is underutilized right now. I'm really looking for you guys and us as edX to keep on pushing that there. A lot of great conversations and great questions happen there, and it's made edX better. And it, I hope that we can continue to contribute back to the community using Slack. Um, so that being said, um, does anybody have any questions? Sure. So um, all those uh, developments uh, are on the master branch, so 
Uh, so, so not all of them. So Adyen is something that we are we are currently developing. Uh, the other are part of our roadmap and things that we are going to be building in the near future. Um, but they are the, the intention of all of our code goes under the master branch. They will be making its way out to the open edX community at some point. If you feel like it's something that needs to be accelerated, we are looking for you know contributions to make this because this is things that we are trying to accomplish too, and we are more than willing to help. Uh, with, with some of the architecture decisions and everything else that goes along with that. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Are there aspirational dates associated with those? Um, <laughs> yes, there's always aspirational dates associated <laughs> with everything. Um, I think we're looking, um, the one that I can tell, uh, Adyen is gonna be within the, within the quarter uh, that we're currently in, uh, hopefully, or, or July timeframe. And then we are looking to do product bundles in the fir first next two quarters of next year. And uh, plug and pay processors is along those paths too. Is the, the first three are really where there's a little bit more certainty in the roadmap. And then the rest are kind of aspirational as far as prioritization and in need. Um, our fiscal year, not year. Yes, sorry. I, <laughs> I, I forget that quarters don't match <laughs> the, the real world. <laughs> uh, we're looking in the next couple of months. Um, How does doing the receipt? How does theming? theming. Um, so we, we do have some theming built into that, but we, we have extended, uh, we do have the ability on a white label basis, so we do have the multi-tenant theming uh, built into that. I'm not sure how, how closely that ties into parallel with the LMS, uh, the way that we've done uh, theming as far as LMS goes. I don't build you. Yes, uh, those pages are hosted by e-commerce intentionally. So if you want to add an experiment, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, the ability to have our pattern libraries extracted one level is another way, you know, if the community wants to help out with, we are also looking to do the same thing because we don't like the theme twice either. Um, but for the interest of time, we're trying to get as much stuff out there as quickly as possible uh, in the right way. I think we have time for one or two yeah. more. Um, So um, the way that the Oscar e-commerce site works is not the way that the product of edX wants to sell the sites, but that doesn't mean you can't use that to your advantage. If you want to have a traditional e-commerce front end, Oscar would be a great place to start. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we, we did hide it for a little bit, uh, but if you go to, uh, the idea is, is that ecommerce.edx.org really is only responsible for hosting the payment selection page and the receipt page at this point. That, that though that's built into Oscar, we're not really utilizing it. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't in your own instance. All right, so I think we're out of time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the scheme of all that's going on with open edX and edX, uh, what's the priority of, of commerce from your perspective <laughs> or? Uh, from my personal perspective, my, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> so um, I, along the lines of what e-commerce does is it really, it's kind of the heart and almost all of our product development goes through this as far as a platform goes, is that this is the way that you get people discovering a course into a course. Uh, so almost everything that we do touches uh, an aspect of Django, Oscar, or Otto, and really we are trying to constantly improve it. Uh, improving the flow and doing some other things are part of our product roadmap, uh, and making it a better experience for the learner is always top of mind for us as far as that goes. Um, you know, it's, it, it's something that we strive to make better all, all the time, so I don't know if that answered your question completely. To, to the community the way that, say, uh, reporting, you know, is a big deal or analytics? Yeah. I think um, the, what analytics you can get from zero dollar orders and going through this process it is an advantage and you get an insight into the customer. You can see uh, one of the things that is a, I, I've found useful is that we ha do have the ability to see abandoned baskets and people who have exited the flow and where Perhaps there's things that you can improve. So if you have a two-step enrollment and you are offering free enrollments and people aren't following the second step, 
you do actually have that information and analytics to be able to say, hey, this person abandoned checkout. So those traditional e-commerce uh, metrics, I find highly valuable to make product decisions and inform the right choices. So, all right. All right. Um, yeah, we'll, um, uh, we have one more. One more. <laughs> I don't see anything in the roadmap about uh, this was one of the first things I had to do after understanding uh, this success. Uh, <coughs> was a general team report to dispatch the money on the different organization we work with. How do you do it? How do you do it? Do you do it? So our, most of our, our reporting is happening through our analytics team. So this all feeds into our analytics warehouse pipeline. And we are using that on the second side for, from a financial standpoint to uh, get our monthly totals, everything else that goes along with that. Um, analy yeah. And, and this and this guy here can talk a little bit more about that. But yes, so we, we feed that into the system and then we do our reconciliation on the back side of that. So we, are, we do go through our warehouse for that. Uh, but Auto does offer the ability to do some financial reporting out of the dashboard too. Yeah. But we, I'd love to talk to you more about that too. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks.